This is part one of a four-part series I'm doing on routers for the woodworking show. Part number two will include using shop-made jigs. I'll show you how to make them and you'll find that they increase the accuracy and the versatility of your routing. Part three will kind of center around a specific jig and that's a dovetail jig. I felt that dovetails are the hallmark of quality and I think they show true craftsmanship and once I show you how to tune and use that jig, you'll be making perfect dovetails all the time. Part four is more project based where we'll talk about how a rail and style bit when combined with a raised panel bit can provide beautiful raised panel doors. Perfect addition to any shop project. So now what we'll talk about is that the, each one of these presentations is going to last about 45 minutes. You'll have an opportunity to ask questions while I'm doing this, but I'll also put aside an extra 15 minutes at the end of each one of these to answer your questions more specifically. So figure about an hour for each one of these presentations. The if information you'll be getting will provide, I think, everything that you need to be really proficient at using what hopefully will become your favorite tool as well. Well, routers are basically just a motor used to spin a router bit at high speed. And that router bit is going to provide a really pretty profile on the edge of the face of some material. And they generally come in two different configurations. The first is what's called fixed base, where the router's bit is predetermined. Then there was the plunge base, where the bit itself is inserted in there, but the bit depth is variable. In the fixed base, you would insert a bit into there, and the bit always sticks out of the bottom of the router. So that before you're using it, while you're using it, and after, you have to be careful that, that bit doesn't contact anything you don't want to damage. In the plunge base, the bit is set in here, but as you plunge the base, the bit is pushed into the work and then pulled back out when you're finished. It's an easier way to work around templates. It's a much safer way because the bit starts up and finishes inside that base. They also come in power ranges. Um, some of the first routers came out as really big three or three and a half horsepower routers, and they were used mainly in router tables. It's really hard to control a router that big by hand. Uh, I feel it's like trying to balance a bowling ball on a stick. So those bigger routers are used in a router table by more professional routers, um, or somebody using much bigger bits or using them for prolonged periods of time. I think they work well for any router uh, user that's going to use them at, in any way, but probably mainly more for professionals. The second type of, of power range is in something like this, uh, two or two and a quarter horsepower. I believe that most woodworkers are well served by something of this size. It has more than enough power to get the biggest bits running. It also has plenty of durability. It's just that it's slightly lighter package at two or two and a half horsepower make it easier for the average person to use. Lastly, we have what's called a palm router. These are much smaller. They are in the three quarter to uh, one and a quarter horsepower ranges, which is still an awful lot of power. But what they were made for is installers a long time ago that wanted to be able to do mortises and hinge work in the field. So these smaller packages made it easier for them to use. You can see by the smaller base, they're easier to get in little places. So each one of these has its benefit, depending upon the type of routing you do. Um, so you can either get the real large, three and a half, the two and a quarter, two and a half, or the small little palm router. Or if you're like most of us, maybe one of each, just in case. Uh, one last thing you'll see is that these are all corded. Um, router manufacturers of late now are beginning to sell a lot of battery operated ones. It's become the thing. And depending upon the size of that battery and the configuration of the tool, you'll get an awful lot of good use out of those too. So it really is a, an issue that you're going to make as to whether or not you like battery operated tools or corded tools. One of the other things you'll find with routers too is that when they were first introduced, they came out as fixed speed. Uh, and most of them in that 20,000, maybe 25,000 RPM, which was fine when you're doing a straight bit like this. Uh, these relatively small diameter bits can spin at 25,000 RPM and they were fine. But as the bits got larger, somewhat like this chamfer bit, which is pretty big, as the outside diameter grows, the speed of that router needs to come down. 
Otherwise, that very high spinning on the outside edge does not contribute at all to an easy cut. It generally provides a lot less control over the router and you'll find more burning on it. So router manufacturers have then put in what they call variable speed. And those range anywhere from 8,000 to 23, maybe 25,000 RPM, so that you can gauge the speed of that router with the diameter of the router bit. There's also instances where you may want to slow the router speed down as you're making passes through some fairly intricate areas to keep them burning. Um, so variable speed is really important. The last thing that comes with many variable speed routers is what they call soft start. It allows the motor to kind of ramp up to speed and then ramp back down again. If I were to start a router uh, at 25,000 RPM, there'll be a pronounced jerk. And you've got to make sure that you control the router at that and keep it away from the edge of what you're routing because it could very easily damage that edge. But with a, a soft start, it's much easier as it comes up. It doesn't have that jerk to it. And I find that it prolongs the life of the motor. I, I used to live in a colder climate and I felt that that, uh, that ramping up a little bit slower made it easier for a router to get used to the cooler temperatures with its grease and those kind of things in there. So those are the ideas on, on speed. And lastly, routers to hold that router bit need some kind of a collet. This is one here. This is a, a quarter inch collet. I've got a half inch collet in the router that's sitting here. So they're gauged to use the different shank diameters of routers, and generally those shank diameters are in quarter and half inch. In the larger routers like these, they almost always come with a half, and they will very often come with a second quarter inch collet. If they don't, these would be available as an accessory, which either. On the smaller little palm routers, they only come with quarter inch collets. It's not that they can't control a larger bit, which again at one horsepower would be more than enough, but it's just that with that relatively small base, it's hard to control that router bit well, so the only thing that you'll find in palm routers is the quarter inch collet, and that's why. So the idea is there's a lot of different variables in the routers and what to choose from. And if you look at the accessories that come with routers, there's quite a few of those, and I've got a few laid out here to, to talk about. The first is, these are template guides. Uh, this particular somewhat odd looking one, I guess, is, is specific to Bosch routers, but its goal works like all the rest. It sits at the bottom of the router and it controls the path of a router bit, like this one, that doesn't have a bearing on it. If I have a router bit with a bearing, the bearing kind of controls where it is on a, on a project. But without one, and let's just say I'm fluting or I'm using a dovetail jig where this would be a dovetail bit to control that and make sure that it stays within that jig, they use what's called a template guide. This is the one for Bosch. This is the one that most people are probably a little bit more familiar with. This is called a PC template guide. Porter Cable is the one that first came out with these. Uh, so they kind of gotten the moniker as PC. They fit in pretty much everybody else's router. Um, you'll find them generally in two different looks, this one in more of the silver type look and this in the more of a brass type look. They both work the same. Uh, the one thing that I, I, I will tell you is that I found that with the PC bits or PC template guides, there's a lot of vibration in routers. And over time, because the holes are really small on the base of the router, it's hard to get your hand in there and tighten this into the base. Well, over time, if that vibration begins to loosen this template guide, you'll find that the bit itself is not being controlled as well as it could be. So here's a little hint. What I did is I went to standard big box store and all I did was get a couple of these O-rings. You'll just get the correct size, in fact, bring one with you. The object is then that they are just stretched over the threads of that template guide. So then when you put the locking ring on, and firm it up, no amount of vibration is going to loosen that. It works really well. Don't worry about heat. They won't break down because this is not spinning. The router bit inside of it is spinning. The template guide does not. You'll also see that a lot of router kits come with edge guides like these. Some individual routers do. If they don't come with your router, they're available as accessories. But that what their job is to just control that router, especially in areas where you don't have a, a bearing on that bit. I talked earlier about 
the small little palm routers and the fact that these got into really, really nice tight places. The problem is that this relatively small base can be a little bit unstable when you're working with it as well. And it also doesn't hold template guides. So many manufacturers now are coming out with a round plate to fit their square based palm routers that also have the ability to hold template guides. So kind of the best of both worlds there too. So these are some of the accessories that are available. If you look in tool manufacturers catalogs, you'll find an unlimited number of the ones uh, that are out there. I would suggest you buy them on need. Don't just buy them because they're out there. Now a discussion about router bits. And there's quite a few of those to choose from. So a lot of woodworkers prefer to buy a set just so they can make sure that they've got all these different profiles. And I'm kind of hoping maybe you won't do that. Uh, the rationale for me is that when you buy a set, you may be buying 50 bits at one time. And in most cases, the profiles are relatively limited, but they're iterations of each other. And you'll never use all of those. And in most cases, the bits that you're buying are mainly meant more for a DIY user, occasional routing, as opposed to a, a woodworker or, or a more professional. So my suggestion is when you buy a bit, buy the bit that's project specific. So your project calls for a specific bit, buy that one and buy a good one when you're doing it. Now it's impossible to define what a good bit is. Uh, there's no objective way to test these. Everybody's tried that. Depending upon the wood you're routing, the person doing the routing, the speed at which you're doing it, and all those things can adversely affect the, the ability of that bit to do a good job. But I did find in general that better bits cost more money. And there's, there's a reason for that. What you'll find is that the steel in the better bit is better. The carbide that's used as the cutters on here is virgin carbide. It's not an amalgam that's been used two or three different times. It has been brazed or welded to the steel body so perfectly that in many cases it's hard to even tell that it was added to it. That's a sign of quality. And lastly, the bearing that's on there is a seal bearing. No dust gets in there and it should spin freely for the life of that bit. And so I believe that buying a better bit is a better idea. And if you feel that you really want to buy a set, I've kind of assembled six different profiles here that I think pretty much encompass most of the work that you'll do, either used together or in combination. So the first one is what's called a roundover bit. In this particular bit, the edge that's cut is slightly rounded, like this. The second one is the yang to its ying, and that is a, a scallop like this. And if I take the roundover and add it to a scallop, I get what's called an OG, probably the most popular of all router bits. So those two are the first two. Then we have what's called a pattern bit. This particular one is called a top bearing pattern bit. And the reason is when it's used in a handheld router, it hangs upside down like this, the bearing is on the top. It's always displayed in packages like this, which makes it look like it's bottom bearing. Now there is a bottom bearing bit and that would be down here. And the only difference between the use of either of those is the position of the pattern or the, the template that you're using it with. So the way these work is that the bearing itself, its diameter is exactly the same as the width of the cutters on the top. So as that bearing runs the edge of the pattern, anything extending beyond the pattern is trimmed by that bit. They come in all different sizes. This one is a chamfer, particular 45. It will do really big work like you see here, or I can use just the very edge of this to work to do what they call breaking the edge on projects. If I've got a perfectly square sharp edge on a project, it's very chip prone, but it also doesn't hold finish as well. So by taking my chamfer bit and taking off an almost imperceptible edge off of that, it breaks that edge, allows finishes to stick better, and takes away almost any chance for chipping or, or fraying on that edge. This is a rabbit bit. It provides the, the groove around the inside of a, of a project uh, for a frame for a picture or maybe for a, a, a panel for a door. The bearings on here are interchangeable. As you make bigger or smaller bearings, you can make the opening bigger or smaller and of course adjust the depth so they come all different. The last one is what's called a straight bit. 
These are used mainly for, for grooving uh, and mortise work. One of the issues I found with a straight bit, however, is that in a straight bit, since the cutters are straight, when you're doing your mortising, especially deeper ones, the sawdust that's created as this turns doesn't come out of the hole and ultimately winds up trapping the bit, leading to burning and wandering and that kind of thing. So you have to do multiple passes, pull the bit out each time, vacuum off the, the, the uh, amount of sawdust that's in there, and do it again. So as an alternative to this straight bit, there's also what they call a straight bit here, and this is what's called an upcut spiral. Since all bits, when they're turning in a router, turn in clockwise directions, as I turn this in a clockwise direction, hopefully you'll see that the flutes spin upwards. So what they're doing is they're taking the sawdust in there and pulling it out of the hole, much like a drill bit, so I can go deeper and longer passes in mortising without having to pull that up and constantly clean out the hole. Another straight bit, and this one is called a downcut spiral. So in here, as I'm turning it, you'll see the flutes are actually going down in this one. And they're usually used for inlay work. So if I'm trimming the edge or the face of material to inset a complementary wood to the front of it, I don't want any chips in there. And because this bit cuts down, it doesn't have any chips in it. So you have three different types of straight bits. So my point is that if you buy a set, you're not necessarily going to be buying real high quality bits. So I like kind of building my own set. I will generally tell people to buy a bit based on the project and build your set that way. But if you're planning on doing something where you really feel you want to set, this is a great way to start this. And again, there's a lot of router bits. Um, I think my personal collection is well over 100 of them, and I know that there's probably two or three times as many that manufacturers sell. So trying to buy a kit like that is, is just out of the question. So buying them in the way that I'm suggesting will provide a great set of bits that will last all but forever, cut beautifully, don't burn and don't chip. And to me, that's a benefit of having a really good bit. So that's the lowdown on router bits. Using a router is pretty straightforward. And to be honest, it's really simple, but I think you'll see the results are pretty awesome. So the first thing, is to make sure that somewhere you find your manual. Um, these took, they took a long time to write these, the manufacturers did, and there's a lot of good information in there. Sometimes it'll help jog an old memory about things you should have been doing, but it's a good idea to find this and kind of take a read through it. Secondly, the router is exceptionally loud, throws an awful lot of sawdust and chips and shavings, and I think you'll find that having some kind of hearing protection and glasses is, is all but a must. So what we'll start with is selecting a router bit profile. Um, the one I'm planning on using here is called an OG. It's got a small little cove at the top and a round over at the bottom. It's a, a, a very popular type bit style, but I'm gonna use this to do the routing. So I wanna insert it in the router. And I found that if you push it in too far, you'll get it too close to the collet. And, and router bits, the shank and the router bits is straight, and then it kind of flares a little bit as it gets into the body of the router. I don't want that collet to grab onto the flare. I want it just on the shank. So the easiest way to get around that is push it in all the way, the, the bit, pull it out about an eighth of an inch or so, like that, and then tighten it. That way you're always sure that you're getting it on the collet. And tightening it can be a little bit troublesome with some routers, especially if you use what they call a two-hand technique, or knuckle buster, as I like to call it. So what I'm gonna suggest is learning to do this with a one-headed method and squeezing. So I'll tighten up the collet to get it as close as I can. And then to finish tightening it, all I'm gonna do is squeeze this. And just the pressure from your hand is more than enough, like this, to provide all the tension you'll need on that collet. The collets are very well designed and they're made to grab the shank beautifully. If you over tighten them, you can crank that collet and ruin it. And there's no fix for that other than a new one. To take the bit off, just doing this in reverse the same way and popping it to loosen it is all that it takes. So practice the one-headed method. I think it'll work. it works a lot better. This also avoids that issue that people have about how much pressure do I put on and things too. Your grip ability will tighten it more than enough. So the router bit is in there. Now the idea is to set that router bit to your, the height you're planning on using it or the depth. And I've already done that in this router. 
I also now want to set the bit speed. When you put a router bit on the router, depending upon what you've got the router turned to, you're going to get an awful lot of revolutionary speed. In router bits from nothing to up to about one inch, you can run that router at 25,000 RPM or whatever your max is. But as the diameter gets larger, you want to slow that down. So a, a one inch to two inch should be down around the 20,000 mark. When you go over two inches, you're getting into the 16,000 mark. And when you get much bigger than that, the slowest speed that your router will go, or up to maybe about 12,000, is plenty. And to kind of explain it, if I were looking at a, a real thin router bit, as it's running 25,000 RPM, the outside cutting edge of that bit, let's just say for, for grins, is going five miles an hour. But if I take that same speed and I run a bit like this, the diameter of this is all but three inches, the outside radius here, that cutter, is spinning at 25,000 RPM, maybe going five times that speed or more. So the idea is I lose um, the ability to control that router bit I also have a tendency, because it's going so fast, to burn things. So by slowing that router speed down, I'd like to try and approximate the outside edge of this wider bit with that of the smaller one. So that's why you're kind of turning it in and out. And there's no fixed uh, speeds on most routers. This particular one goes from 1 to 6. I've seen them that actually have a, an actual gradient on them but I found that most of those aren't terribly reliable. So what I'll suggest is, on the smaller bits, turn it up all the way. On the real big ones, turn it down all the way. And the ones in the middle, turn it up about halfway and maybe dial it back or dial it up depending upon that bit. You'll be close enough. It actually works pretty well. So the last thing is that when you set the router bit, you're gonna set it easily into that cut. And what I'll do is I'll show you on a scrap piece here how we do that and how we proceed with that cut. Again, this part is the easy part. Just inserting the bit in there, selecting the right one in its depth, and getting it all set up to do your route. So let me show you how it works in actual practice. All right, so I've got a board set up here, a piece of poplar um, to route. And what I'm going to do is show you how this bit works. A little preliminary information. Um, I always want to route with a handheld router from left to right. Okay. If you're looking from the top down in that router, you'll see that the bit itself turns in what's called a clockwise direction. And I want to feed that bit into the direction of those cutters so that the wood is coming directly into the cutter face, kind of like the way you push a board through a table saw. So if I hold it like this and I'm rotating this bit, you can see the cutters make contact here. And by doing that, not only do they make solid contact, but the orbit and the rotation of that bit holds this bearing right up against the outside edge. If I were to do this in reverse and route it from right to left, the bit is still turning clockwise, but it's running over the back of the bit, and you'll find that doesn't work well at all. In fact, it'll kind of run on you. Again, and not a perfect analogy, but put the board on the back of the table saw and try and push that board through that way, you'll find out it just kind of takes off. And that's the idea here. So you're always going left to right when you're using a handheld router. Now we've set the router up. I've got my depth already adjusted. Like this. So the router bit is sticking out on the outside bottom edge. I have my speed set up for about a mid-speed range or so. And I want this bearing to ride on the face of that. So I'll be going left to right. Your passes need to be slow and somewhat controlled. When you start up the motor, allow it to just gently come into the cut and then finish your cut when you're done. And always be aware of the fact that that bit is spinning there. If you have a fixed base router, you'll have to be careful as it starts up and slows down. With this plunge base, I can push it into the wood and when I'm done, pop it up out of there so that bit is spinning on its own without having anything near it. Okay, so let's run this through once. And again, I'm just going to start it gently on the edge here. I'll plunge this until the bit comes out as far as I want it, and then make my pass from left to right.
and you'll notice how the bearings stayed on that edge. The cut quality is even and perfect all the way across and finished up no problem at this end. So it's a great way to learn how to do um, routing. Now if I were doing a two-sided piece, I wouldn't do this first and then this one. I always want to do end grain first because again, as that bit is turning clockwise, there's a tendency it may chip out the material on this edge. So if I do this route first and then I come in and follow it this way, that will take off that potential chip. Okay, that's how to do just a regular board. And again, left to right. Let me show you a little confusing way to learn the way to do it when you're doing on the inside part of a frame. Okay, now I talked about a slightly confusing uh, issue when you're trying to route a frame like this. This is what's called a rabbit bit. It has a bearing on one side of it uh, on the end, and it's got a couple of cutters on the side edge. And the way that this bit works is the bearing itself rides on the material and it cuts a, a rabbit out. It cuts a, 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 a channel or a groove, in this case, to set a piece of glass on or maybe a, an art frame. Now, I told you when you're routing, you're always routing left to right. And again, it's because the bit is spinning clockwise and I wanna make sure that that's always cutting into the wood. But if I'm standing on this side and I decide I'm gonna go left to right on the inside edge of this, you'll notice that in this case, I'm routing on the back side of that bit. It's the wrong direction. So when I'm doing the inside of this, if I'm standing on the front, I wanna go right to left, which is actually in effect left to right. That makes sense? So if I were doing this from this side, and I put my router here to route it, I'm back to left to right. But a lot of people like to route from one side and they'll just keep turning the frame back and forth to do it. So just remember, as you're going there, think always that the rotation of that bit, which is clockwise, has to contact the wood. You'll know right away whether or not that bit is running the correct way. If it's running over the back of it, it's gonna take off. So the idea is as soon as you see that or you feel it, you realize, okay, that's what happened and do it again. This happens quite a bit when you're trying to route a, uh, uh, or, or, or put a rabbit in a circle on the inside of a circle. You'll get confused all the time. It happens to the best of us, don't worry about it. So this whole process is how we're using a handheld router and, and going left to right and some of the issues that you have going with it. Let's go over to the router table and we'll talk about the same process, except we're gonna take the motor and we're gonna turn it upside down. So routing at the router table is just slightly different than what we talked about just a minute ago in doing handheld operation. The router bit is still turning clockwise, but in this case, it's upside down. So the only feed rate we have that works well is going from right to left this time. Again, because the spinning of that bit is gonna allow the face of that cutter into the face of the wood. And that's really what you're looking for. In fact, on this table, you never want to try and do what they call climb routing. And that's routing from this edge back or left to right. It's just really dangerous. The piece of wood can be grabbed there and thrown out while you're using it. So it's always right to left. And I think a router table is probably one of those almost must have accessories for your router. It comes in very handy, all but indispensable for routing small pieces of material like this or irregularly shaped material or maybe round material, a router table is really important. They all come with a few different features. The first is they have a fence on the front here that adjusts to provide as minimal a clearance as possible around that bit. The bit is inserted the same way into the collet like we talked about before, and you raise and lower that bit depending upon uh, the mechanism built into your particular router table. Many router tables come uh, with what they call fingerboards or pressure boards. These can be used in a multitude of ways. You can use them like this, both the head and behind that bit to keep the wood that you're, you're routing up against the face. They can be used above the board or of the table like this to keep that board down against the table. And they can be used in combination where they keep them up against the fence and down against the table. Again, almost all uh, router tables come with an accessory like this. When I'm using the router, I've got the same speed setup issues we had before, so I'm still gonna adjust those depending upon the bit. And again, because this is underneath the table, it's a little bit tougher to get to, but the same adjustments there. And the way to set the bit up to work the best in this router table is to make sure that the face of this bearing 
is always even with the face of the fence. There shouldn't be any case in which the bearing itself is more than halfway out in front of the fence because in effect then you're almost trying to route on the back and the front side of that bit and that's a bad thing. So you're always working towards the front. So either part of this uh, bit sticking out or all of it up to the face of that bearing and that'll give you the best cut. One of the things I found too is that if you're using a very real uh, convoluted bit, uh, a large one, you can start with the bit lowered in the table, make your first pass around all the edges, then raise the bit a little bit and continue almost like you were doing it with a router except that you're not lowering the bit from there, you're raising the bit from here. So all of those things are possible with a router table and I really do feel that this is one of those all but essential things. So just so that you see a board going through here, let's do a quick run uh, through this board. I'll use the opposite face of the one that I was using before. And again, we're going to run this into the front. You'll notice how smoothly it goes through as the bit is cutting it and it's because it's cutting from right to left because the motor is upside down. there is a pretty profile. That one is called an OG. This one's got a fillet, a small little flat spot on the top, a cove in here and a round over here, another fillet at the bottom. One bit, one pass, beautiful type look to it. Router tables are terrific. So you also noticed on that pass that I made there and the one that we did with the hand router that the profile came out pretty nicely. But there are those cases where maybe that didn't happen. Uh, you burned an edge or you chipped something let me show you some quick tips on how to fix those. Maybe avoid them first, but fix them if you couldn't avoid them. So the first thing I did was I took this board and I ran it so that what I could do is route end grain first. And what I wanted to do was show you that by routing the end grain first is that bit is turning clockwise. It has a tendency to split out these edges. Okay, so the fix for that is to do end grain first and then edge grain as you go. So I'll run it past the router bit one more time and you'll see how that clean that edge up beautifully. So whenever you're routing uh, four sides, route end grain then edge so that the end grain then if there were chip out and this one did that you'll have no problem cleaning that up. So now, here's that chipped out edge, the one that had all that material kind of sticking out the outside of it. So by routing end grain first, then coming around to the face, that takes care of all that little chip out. Got a little bit of fur at the top, that's kind of normal when you're routing. But that's the idea. Secondly, what I did a little bit earlier is I spent some time just sitting with my project on the bit. The longer it sat on the bit, the greater the chance that you're going to build friction like this and burn that edge. So there's a couple of things that you can do to take care of that. If these, and they usually are happening around corners and edges, because you have a tendency to slow down the router as you work around those edges, you may find if you continue to burn the wood, slow the router bit speed down, because that will help you a little bit maintain a slightly less chance of having that friction build up that, that kind of heat. Second thing is, you'll never be able to sand that out of there. No matter how well you work at it, it's just not going to work. It will ruin that beautiful profile. So there's a couple different things that you can do for it. So the first is, you can take this to the table saw, or you can take this to the joiner and remove that one little part. Let me do that and I'll be right back and show you what the difference is. Okay, so I use the table saw here to take about a sixteenth of an inch off that edge. So when I run the router bit past it again, it will be deep enough to remove that edge. Okay, that works really well if while you're still routing, you want to make some changes. So here's what this will look like now, run past there with that little edge trimmed out.
Now I removed all but a nothing, maybe a sixteenth of an inch, and I pretty much got rid of that entire burn mark. Okay, if I'd go a little bit deeper taking it off at the, at the table saw or the miter saw, it would be fine because then I'd remove all of that. If, on the other hand, you finished your routing and now you realize at the very end that you can't believe it, you feel a little knob uh, there, it sometimes means that a little bit of sawdust got on the bearing face and it skipped over a spot, leaving a little bit of extra material or it slightly burned something. Don't try and sand it. What you can do is take it with a burn mark, take a Q-tip with a little bit of water, run it on that burn mark, and the Q-tip's water will soak into that burn mark and slightly raise it proud of the surface. And use the bit that you use to take that profile as a scraper, and it'll pull that burn mark right out of there. It's a great little way to just fix small problems when you see them, other than losing your mind over them. And again, the little knob that's on there, same thing. If you are still routing, go back and route. But if you're done, you'll never get that router bit in the same elevation again. So use the profile of that bit, which is the perfect scraper, to remove that little mark. So those are a couple of ways to fix problems. The next is, when you're routing, the router bit again is turning clockwise. And if you're routing, and you're routing in this direction, so this is left to right in this case, you'll notice that the grain of the wood is running with the direction of the cut. So as a router bit turns in there, there's really no chance that it's going to chip the wood out. If, on the other hand, the way I'm routing is in this direction, and I'm going left to right, as the router bit gets up into here, you'll notice that the grain is kind of running into that part there, there's a greater chance of chipping material in that particular spot. So if at all possible, while you're doing your layouts, that you can route areas of that wood where the grain is always running with the cut, you're fine. If it turns out like this one, that there was no way that you could do both of those routing in the correct direction, then on the areas that are potentially prone to chipping out, make multiple shallow passes and get at it that way. That's the easiest way to keep that chip out at bay because what you're doing is taking nice small passes. One of the other things that can cause burning is a router bit with debris on it. Um, this is maple and it doesn't have an awful lot of issues with it. But when you're routing cherry or pine, the pitch and the tar in those have a tendency to build up behind the edge of that face of the router bit. The way that router bits work is that the heat they build up when they're working is extended from that router's bit edge, the, the carbide edge, onto the blade body and it's dissipated that way. If a lot of buildup on this edge and the trailing edge of sawdust or pitch and tar get in there, it inhibits the, the, the free flow of heat from one to the other and that's going to cause burning as well. So what you may want to do before you're ready to start routing, take a quick look at your bit. And if you find that it's got a little debris on it, something like simple green or whatever takes it right out of there. If you have a, a, a spray that you want to use, they work well too, but with a caution. The bearing on here needs to spin free. And a lot of these are sealed bearings and they should be fine, but I don't want to get any of that solvent inside where the, the bearing is because you could ultimately freeze that bearing. And if that's the case, this bearing is never running at the bit speed. It's running on the edge of the board guiding the bit. And if it's frozen in there without turning correctly, it'll spin at the same rate as the router bit and burn the daylights out of something and you'll never get it out of there. So it's just a quick check to like make sure that that's not what's happening. I, when I start to, I take the router bit and the shank and I kind of give it a little twist. And I feel if there's any kind of grating or whatever in there, they make a, a lube for this. Uh, a lot of uh, aftermarket uh, things are around. I like those because a simple drop, it looks like a, a syringe, a simple drop of oil on there will allow that, that uh, bearing to run freely. If it doesn't, don't use the bit. Uh, you can replace these bearings. A lot of the manufacturers make uh, replacement bearings or different ones, but using that bearing that's somewhat frozen or somewhat sticky is only going to cause you problems. So those are some of the issues that can happen when you're routing. One last thing. If I'm routing this project and I am routing the front and both sides, 
but I'm not routing the back, one edge will be fine because as I come across it, I'm removing the potential chip out. But the other side, when I route it, is going to chip out and there's no way to run the back because it's supposed to be even. So what you can do is you can clamp a, a, a sacrificial block to the edge of here, the same thickness as the wood. So as you're routing across this and coming this way, as that bit is turning, it won't chip this out because it's been protected by this little block. No different than putting a, a, a small little block behind your miter uh, uh, when you're trying to cut a miter to keep that edge from splitting out. So those things work really well with this as well. So you may have heard the term climb routing. And I want to talk to you a little bit about it because I think it, it deserves some explanation. When you're using a handheld router, you're always going left to right. And again, because you want the bit's face to be cutting into that wood. But there are times, especially when trying to use a bit like this rabbiting bit, where doing that is causing chip out. And no matter how much you may take small passes and, and, and multiple passes, it just seems to continue. And rather than ruin your project, there is a technique that you can use that will greatly reduce, if not eliminate, that potential for uh, chip out. And it's called climb routing. It's done with a handheld router. It's not done on a router table. It's done with a handheld router and you're going right to left instead of left to right. So if I'm routing the inside edge of this, which again, I can't go back and trim, I can't do anything with that to fix it, and I'm getting chip out, if I route instead from right to left, remember as the bit's turning, the cutters are not making direct contact with the wood, the wood is riding over the back of the cutters. And what'll happen is it has a tendency to shave that wood as opposed to cut it. Now you're not gonna have as much control at all. The bearing is not gonna be pulled up against the edge like it is when you're correctly routing left or right. But what it does in that shaving motion is to remove the potential for chipping. So make a couple of thin, short passes. You'll notice that they're very irregular. They're not straight like they should be with that bearing, but it's because of the direction that you're going. And then once you get it close to your finished project, even though it's a little bit irregular, then route correctly from left to right. Cutting that now with most of the bulk of that material removed almost always results in a nice clean cut without chip out. Again, it's something to think about. It's, it's certainly not the norm. Uh, it is not quite as easy and it's a little uncomfortable feeling when you're doing it. But when all else fails, again, multiple passes, sharp bit, um, those kind of things, and they don't work rather than ruin the project, try climb routing. You may find it works really well. I found most cases with routing are pretty simplistic, pretty straightforward. And the fact that you have a problem with it is something usually pretty simple. So make sure that your bits are sharp. Make sure that they turn well, the bearing is, is turning well. Make sure that they're clean. Um, a good bit, a clean bit should run beautifully. If you are doing maple or cherry, if you can get through an entire project without burning, you're a better woodworker than I. Uh, maple is exceptionally hard. It has a tendency to burn pretty easily. The bit spins on the front and it generates an awful lot of heat in a, in a flash. On cherry, the pitch and tars and those have a tendency to cause some friction as well and you can burn those. But that being said, all of the routing is pretty easy by making some adjustments. Remember, bit speed is important. Slowing your bit speed down if you can't keep up with the, the rate because you, what you don't want to see is those, those burn marks on there. And then routing in multiple passes to keep any chip out that seems to be happening all the time from recurring. So that's the lowdown on routing. Uh, I found in most cases that, that routing is a, is a pleasure. I've added so much value to a project by learning how to route. And what I've shown you is some pretty simplistic ways to route and also how to fix those things that were bad. The only way that you'll get better is by practicing. So buy some stock material. It doesn't have to be anything special and try different profiles. You can also try a profile's different parts of that bit by moving the bit down a little bit or moving it up a little bit more or moving the fence forward or backward just a little bit on, on a router table. You can create all kinds of profiles just from that one bit. So lastly, by good bits when the time comes, route with some practice so that you feel comfortable at it.